Um, hello, everybody. Welcome to APAD Talks. My name is Andra Rusick of Scheinbaum and Rusick in Santa Fe. I'm a member of APAD and also the chair of the Education Committee. As part of our education program, we are pleased to present APAD Talks. As many of you know, APAD is dedicated to creating and maintaining high standards in the business of exhibiting, buying, and selling photographic art. With that in mind, we are thrilled that the photography show will once again be held at the Park Avenue Armory at the end of April. It's an exciting return for the show, and we hope that you'll all be able to join us. I want to let you know that tickets are available online at APAD.com. We do have early bird pricing that ends today, so if you'd like to get uh, an early bird ticket, please go visit our website. You can also find on our website all of the um, galleries and dealers that are participating in the show, as well as all of our past talks and our exposure newsletters that are under the media section. Now, let me introduce our guest to you. Carol Kaino has written about art, photography, and contemporary culture for such publications as The New Yorker, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, The Atlantic, Town and Country, and many art magazines. She has been a fellow at the Coleman Center at the New York Public Library and the USC Annenberg Getty Arts Journalism Program. She is the author of the new book, Double Click, which just came out this week and is attracting critical acclaim. Jean Dykstra is a photography critic and the editor of Photograph Magazine. She has contributed essays to numerous books and catalogs on photography and has served as a juror and a curator for photography exhibitions. She appears regularly as a panelist for APAD Talks during the photography show presented by APAD and also writes our monthly APAD newsletter, Exposure. Nicole Strauss is owner of Nicole Strauss Public Relations, her agency, which celebrated 25 years in business last year, specializes in creating strategic communication campaigns for museums, galleries, art fairs, and architects. She told Carol Kaino about the photography exhibition which led to Carol's new book. Um, I'd like to introduce all of these people to you now and let them get started. I will say that at the end of this talk, we will have time for questions. Please put your questions into the Q&A and I will read them to our uh, guests and they'll try to answer everything. Um, I will also at the end put a link to the book if into the chat if anyone would like to be able to click the link, it's there so you can get the book. Now, without further ado, let me uh, hand it off to our three presenters. Sandra. And, uh, and thank you, APAD, for hosting this talk. We, we really appreciate it. Um, I want to start by, by uh, telling you, Carol, how much I enjoyed this book, not only because it's such an interesting story about these twins and these, these photographers that uh, we probably should know more about, but also because you kind of chart the, the history of fashion magazines and their role not only in kind of reflecting, but also in dictating how women should dress and how women should be. And you talk about the, the role of the McLaughlin twins and they, they really were part of the heyday of, of fashion magazines. You know, when people like Irving Penn and Erwin Blumenfeld and 24 Cell and they were sort of part of that crowd. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it's a really interesting kind of untold story. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> and, and I want to jump in and say, I just loved the book as well, Carol, um, the way you weave biography together with history makes it such an amazing, enticing story. So thank, thank you, you for doing this book. Um, I really love it. And thank you to APAD for hosting us. Yeah. For so thank you for so this much. Opportunity. Yeah. So before we jump in, I'm curious to know how you want to describe the twins, um, Carol, mm. because it can get very confusing um, yeah. which one is which. And they had numerous names to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> well, the bylines by which they're known are different from the, uh, that was very confusing figuring out how to write about it for the book. Yeah. Growing up, uh, their given names were Francis McLaughlin, Francis Marie McLaughlin, and Catherine Marie McLaughlin, 
Catherine took the name Fluffy as a small child because their babysitter was Fluffy was Flossy, and then she changed her name. To, she got married and then her byline changed from Catherine McLaughlin to Catherine Abbey. And um, anyway, they had shifting. And then after her husband's death, Frances McLaughlin changed her byline to Catherine McLaughlin Gill. So anyway, they it's it's confusing. But if you sit down and think about it, maybe it's not that confusing. Okay. So, so as far as the talk goes, are you going to yeah. refer to them think, as Francis and Catherine? Yes, that is what we've decided to do, just to keep them okay. on the straight. Okay, meeting. good. So I'm going to try. We're, I'm going to try. We're clear on that. Yes. <laughs> so now the whole reason why we're here today is because um, in 2017, I told Carol about an exhibition at Howard Green <laughs> And that kind of started this ball rolling. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to mention briefly what the exhibition was about that gather, gathered us here today. And um, and then, you know, let's talk because you ended up meeting a family member at this right. exhibition. But do you want right. to start showing those photos, Carol? Sure. Yeah. Why yeah. Not I get yeah. It? That's a great idea. So I'll just be talking while you're getting the pictures together. Um, but the exhibition was called Lives and Still Lives, Leslie Gill and Francis McLaughlin Gill and their circle. Mm -hmm. and boy, did they have a glamorous circle. And this exhibition was at Howard Greenberg Gallery. It opened in May of 2017. And I invited you, Carol, and immediately you became immersed yeah. in the work. But there was one room in particular that you loved. So tell us about yes. that. So that was the room full of family pictures. And Nicole had told me when I started writing about the show, because generally as a journalist, you write about shows in advance. There, She had a twin. The whole family were, photogra were photographers. Um, there might, we weren't really sure what it was going to be. But when I went to the show, after having written about it a couple of times, I was just entranced by this room full of family photographs. So I was standing around, I think, in front of this photo in particular, um, which was taken by the husband of one of the twins, who was a photographer, James Abbey Jr. And this is the twins with their husbands and a couple they were very close to, Lisa Fonsagreve, who later married Irving Penn, her husband, Fernand Fonsagreve, a very well-known photographer who's now represented by Deborah Bell, who has a great show up of his work. This is Francis. I'm going to call her Franny because I have an English accent and it's just too painful to pronounce it in the American way. This is Catherine. And this is Franny's husband, Leslie Gill, who was a great renowned uh, American still life photographer. Um, so I was gobsmacked by that. Damn it. What's happened here? Let's see. Okay. We can at least get this up. Um, this was taken by... Lisa Fonsagreve, who Lisa Fonsagreve Penn, who also was a photographer in her time. And this is James Abbey Jr., who married mm. Catherine. So I was standing around in front of these photos, and um, this man came up to me and said, I'm Catherine's son. And also, my grandfather was a famous photographer. <laughs> so he started telling me about the whole family. And to make a long story short, he lived. 15 minutes away from where I grew up, lived down the block from someone I'd known since she was born. Our fathers had been in graduate school together. So we knew like millions of many people in common, not millions anyway. Um, so this is also another photo that was in that room of Irving Penn after he married Lisa and this is their son. I mean, and they really were part of a very oh, glamorous. Yeah community. Yes. Yeah. And that's another photo of Lisa taken by Franny. But there are many photos of the family um, of the pens also taken by Catherine. And just these photos, I thought were, these are just their family photos. You know, I was just entranced by it. So now we should go to the PowerPoint, I guess. Yep. Okay, That'd be great. Oops. Carol, those pictures that you showed of the the uh, the twins with their partners and Lisa Fonsagreves, 
were those taken for anything in particular, like for no, publication, or they were just were kind just of camping around? Jimmy and Catherine, James Abbey Jr., who I'm going to refer to as Jimmy, um, they had a carriage house with a studio in it on East 53rd, I think, and they were just playing around in the studio, you know, having fun, taking yeah. photos, which was, the <laughs> these people lived and breathed photography. Yeah. Um, oops. So this is the twins right after they discovered photography at Pratt at the World's Fair. This was taken by their photography teacher, Walter Savardi. This is the twins um, growing up on the left there in Brooklyn. In the middle, they're in Wallingford, um, where their mother moved after their father died in the flu epidemic. On the right there, um, that's their high school graduation. Here they are at Pratt, which is where they um, they were always photographed, but at Pratt, which was one of the few places in the country to have a real photo lab, the few um, schools in the country to have a real photo lab, they discovered photography and decided to become photographers. I mean, part of the the allure of them must have been, especially at Pratt, that they were these two incredibly beautiful young women yeah. who yes. were incredibly talented and hardworking, yes. but they it, they it seemed like from your book that they attracted a lot of attention at Pratt. Always, and they attracted yeah. attention in high school because they were incredibly bright and they were always at the top of their class. Ooh, this slideshow is moving without me a bit. Um, so they were always at the top of their class. They participated in every artistic extracurricular activity. You know, they were always, they were really smart and really yeah. talented and uh, from all accounts, really nice not bitchy. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think they were sharp and they moved quickly, but they weren't mean as far as I can tell. Um, so this is Pratt's photo lab photographed in PM, which is which was a graphic arts magazine, which did devoted a whole issue to Pratt's, um, the wonders of Pratt's fine arts department. I just love that picture. It's so weird. <laughs> um, this is one of the twins taking a photo of their photography teacher. And it seems to have been taken by another twin, the other twin. <laughs> it's not like there were millions of twins running around. Right. <laughs> um, I, I love that photo too. This, oh. why is this doing this? Um, oh, I love it, this photo, yeah, Carol, they, of the twins um, yeah. and Reginald Marsh. Yes. And um, the reason why it means so much to me is it was taken, you told me, by Alfredo Valente, who was a famous photographer at the time who took shots of Broadway celebrities. Yeah. And, um, my grandmother was actually friends with Alfreda Valente. She was an art critic who wrote for uh, Newsday. And she was actually- Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah. fantastic, Nicole. I forgot about that if I knew. Yeah. And, um, and so she knew Reginald Marsh um, and she knew Alfredo Valente. So oh, these God. were names I was lucky to grow up hearing wow. um, from her. And your photo was taken by Valente. You and your sister yeah. were- Yeah, my sister and I girl. posed when we were tiny um for Alfredo Valente for a family photo that my mm. grandmother orchestrated wow amazing so and this is this was this photo taken on a on a movie set yes as a matter of fact it was <laughs> so the twins studied outside of Pratt like many students did with outside art teachers they studied with Yasu Kuniyoshi and Franny did this intensive summer art course with Reginald Marsh and sometime in there, I believe he asked her to participate in this movie that Valente was making about the rise of American art, you know, how everyone was into it these days. And, um, and she's in the final scene where he's teaching a, a devoted young woman to paint under the Brooklyn Bridge. Right. <laughs> and everyone, so Valente took this picture of them, but there were lots of other photographers on the set also taking similar pictures of Franny and him and and the twins and him so it was documented Buffy Catherine was on the set um also taking pictures of her twin with Marsh and then there was another I think it was um Jean Fenn was somebody who was following Marsh around documenting everything he did he took pictures and then the um uh, the director's brother-in-law 
was also on set taking pictures. So as time went on, I started amassing all of these other photos right. of, of similar scenes. It was, and, and I mean, it, this was a, this was a time right when the twins were really very their lives were very much um, they were running very parallel lives, but at some point they diverged a little yeah. bit. Um, well, you know, I later in life. But, I don't understand why Franny was taking classes with Marsh and her sister was going with her, but not participating in the classes. Hmm. So maybe they were diverging a little. Already. Yes. I mean, that's kind of an interesting thing. And I think her sister, I think Franny was also taking um, acting lessons or directing lessons and her sister wasn't. So hmm. Uh, they were because she was very interested in directing people when she took photographs so maybe that was a difference as well um and am i right in remembering that you, they both of the twins worked very hard on these applications yes. to i find this really interesting because yes, i think that's that something that they used to have because they, the, they, right. they they had they worked on these applications for vogue was it vogue yes it was for vogue's pre de paris so there were all sorts of competitions that young women could enter uh, i think it's like a tail end of the depression kind of effect when you couldn't do much with work and you entered competitions to get ahead. I mean, that's just a theory that I have. So in this lower right picture, they are slaving over their competitions for folks. And neither of them, did, neither of them won the competition, but they, that's right. They, but they got noticed by. They got honorable mentions and they were put in an ad that ran in Vogue. Um, I think it was just the honorable mentions that were in this ad and they were rather than getting their own identities, they were listed as the McLaughlin twins. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, they always stood out because they were the twins, the twins. Yeah. Um, and it's the, interesting. I mean, I think f magazines had those kind of contests to to acquire new talent I, in, in many departments. I think Joan Didion got her start. She was in- From oh, the writing contest Vogue's, for Vogue. Vogue's Prix de Paris, um, Joan Didion, Sylvia Plath, um, and a lot of them also won Mademoiselle's competitions. Yeah, it's so, really interesting. Yeah, Jackie Kennedy was a Vogue Prix de Paris winner. Right. I mean, it was a well-established route for young women. Right. And at that time, it's really interesting, the original Vogue Prix de Paris competition, um, the, the Edna Chase says, you know, this is the one of, uh, apart from Hollywood, fashion is the way that young women can really make a career. And and she had, she'd started in Vogue's circulation department addressing envelopes, and she rose through the organization, was able to divorce her, you know, deadbeat husband, and <laughs> make a, I mean, this was really a route by which women could rise, make money, and do something sensible. Right. Uh, you know, it was not a Fliberty Gibbet career at all. If you wanted independence, that was one of the things you could do. And LaGuardia used to, used to come to the, ugh, why are we? Okay, so this is another competition they entered. They entered the College Bazaar competition. This was a magazine that did not seem to exist anywhere. Um, <laughs> it took me like months to track down, a year, about a year to track down. But this was the one where they really got noticed. The editor took them under her wing and um, found them jobs after school. It was the precursor to Junior Bazaar. But this one year, they were recruiting college girls to photograph and model for the magazine in 1940, I think it was. So I here mean, they that's are. another really interesting thing, I think, about, about your book, Carol, is the way you document the rise of junior magazines you know yeah. the, how and how people the mag the industry intentionally they saw that there was a market so they yeah. intentionally created these magazines yeah. for yeah. girls and young women like 17 yeah. magazine and yeah. i guess uh, what was the other one that you mentioned was it junior, junior bazaar junior yeah. bazaar yeah that's really that interesting because it was the war right yeah. It was they were flirting with it during this period with junior yeah. sections and um, and College Bazaar, which hasn't been really written about. Vin Saletti mentions it in in a story, I think. Um, but but this particular year is a really interesting year, and I haven't found it was really hard to find it. Um, but anyway, it's and it hasn't 
well, when maybe we'll get to glamour later, but you know, in the biographies of Condé Nast, there's only one, there are two biographies of him and only one of them talks about glamour, which was for career women. Cause you know, they're sort of regarded as a bit down market or a bit, they're not high fashion. They're not, they're about women. So really who cares? <laughs> <You Yeah. know? laughs> um, anyway, but I think they're fascinating anyway. So this is the photographer who took the picture <laughs> of the twins. <laughs> and he was doing a lot of the photographs, the photographs that weren't done by college girls. And re remind us of his name. Uh, James Abbey Jr. Who yep. um, he, so eventually he started going out with, he met the twins when they were in their jobs after school and started going around town with both of them trying to decide which one to marry. <laughs> right. yeah, someone he, told him he had to make a choice, apparently. His therapist who kept telling him, <laughs> you have to choose. And I'm not, I think it's debatable whether it was really his choice, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, right. it's so funny. Every review of the book talks about it like it was his choice. <laughs> you can guess from their last names which one he married, um, which one married him. <laughs> right. Catherine really adored him. And anyway, so this is a photo he took of them in Montauk. He had, he built the first house on this stretch of the old Montauk highway, which we can see there on the left. Mm. This is their, his, his and Catherine's wedding picture, which they took themselves on a, you know, they set up a timer. They went to a dude ranch. He got divorced. Um, and his first wife was really interesting too. Um, she was the, um, oh, I can't, I'm blanking on his name, but she was the assistant to the George Davis, the famous fiction editor at Mademoiselle and Harper's Bazaar who discovered Carson McCullers, Truman Capote, everybody else. And there was this kind of commune um, at in Brooklyn that some other wonderful woman wrote a book about that I'm totally blanking on. She wrote one of my blurbs. She's such a wonderful, Cheryl Tip, um, Cheryl Tippins. Um, anyway, so Frankie, his first, another F, <laughs> Frankie, his first wife was kind of um, George Davis's amanuensis um, and r ran all of the, did the guest lists for all of the parties at that house. Um, anyway. I mean, they really, the, the set that they traveled in was really remarkable. Yeah. Do you think yeah. they weren't better known? I mean, why weren't they better known, I guess? Until I, I know. And you also, know. you were saying, Carol, the other night that they had this uncanny ability to be where mm -hmm. something was happening. Yeah, yeah. And so well, why weren't they better maybe known? Maybe partly they were making those interesting things happen. I think, I think certainly with Franny when she was hired as the lone woman in the Condé Nast studio, I think it's the phenomenon of, you know, that book that came out, out last year by Emmy Humes. I'm looking, it's on my bookshelf, The Only Woman. She collects these pictures of groups of men where there's one woman, like Hedda yeah, that's Stern. That's an amazing book. You know, yeah, like Hedda Stern. Um, and for years, Hedda Stern was kind of written off as, oh, she was just in that group of men by mistake. You know, it, that, that was just an anomaly that she happened to be there that day when it wasn't at all. And I think, you know, Franny was hired for the Condé Nast studio. Oh, well, I guess we should, ugh, we'll get to that eventually. But she was hired after Irving Penn, who was also unknown at the time. Right. She was the second hire in the Condé Nast studio. And you know, she was hired for a reason. She had talent. She wasn't just like some cute, you know, he didn't hire her for her look, for her right. looks. Right. <laughs> and, um, and she was, there was a review published the other day that said she was the first woman hired. And I went to great lengths to establish she was the only woman. <laughs> they closed and she was still the only woman hired. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, it's really easy to write that off. She, she was the first woman to do many there were other women women on I think two other women on contract before her but she was the only woman in the studio churning out tons of photos mm. all the time and I think it's just easy to overlook it and you know it was bef before there was a 
star system or before we talked about photographers as geniuses yeah. and and women didn't get the same promotion as men and, you know well you have a whole chapter maybe this is jumping ahead but you have a whole chapter called cautionary tales right oh, yeah. thank you for bringing that up yeah. right about basically about, about how women got screwed yeah. <laughs> yeah. so i'm sure that was part of it too Yes, I think uh, so. You encountered encountered a lot of sexism. Um, I don't know the, why this is going back and forth, but I'm writing yes. this book though, Carol, I did I, too. Shall I just say? Well, shall I talk about that or shall I? Um, whatever. Okay. Whatever well, like so let's just do a few pictures and then okay. we'll talk about the sexism I encountered. <laughs> I'd love to talk about that. Thank you. It's um. So this is um. Catherine and Jimmy in their carriage house the year after they'd gotten married and moved in. And this is Franny and Leslie, like right after they'd gotten together and he had split from his first wife and come back from the war. Um, okay. So this is a really well, if you're in these circles and you're into this kind of thing, this is a really well-known picture that Catherine what her second job out of school was being the assistant to Tony Fursell, who was an incredibly famous, she was Vogue's female photographer. Harper's Bazaar had Louise Dalwolf. And um, Catherine assisted her. And this is a photo that Franny took of her, of um, Tony at work. And, you know, and this was in the, um, Metropolitan and National Gallery show um, the new woman behind the camera, for instance. Um, so I think people have wondered what was she taking a picture of, mm. and I theorized this did not look like a high fashion picture. And I knew that um, I knew from their interviews that the twins that Franny was working for Montgomery Ward, and Catherine had some involvement with Montgomery Ward. So as soon as I got to the library, <laughs> I got some help from the librarians figuring out where their um, archives were. And I got some mystified guy to look <laughs> in the catalogs at the right time. Okay. And I found the Montgomery Ward shot. There it was. <laughs> and also I had a little help because there were a lot of pictures of the twins taken by Tony for the Montgomery Ward catalog. <laughs> there are the twins on the right. This is one of many how important those catalogs were too. It wasn't just oh, fashion yeah. magazines, but yeah. you know, sort yeah. of forget that yeah. that these these um you know Sears well, catalogs and Montgomery Ward catalogs, they were really a big deal. Yeah. Well Franny ran, for photographers. The way the twins met up with Jimmy again was Franny went on a Montgomery Ward shoot and Jimmy that was the celebrity photographer they brought in to um, shoot housecoats <laughs> for them. And they had, you know, a famous model doing, it was a great way for models to make money. You could make a lot more money with catalogs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is when Franny is at, um, has been hired by Alex Lieberman. And this is mm -hmm. like the shoot where she really comes into her own about a year after she got the job. And this where is, was she working? So she was brought in by Alex Lieberman oh, to work. Thank you. To work in the Condé Nast studio. She was, um, so her sister, Catherine, was working for Tony for sale. Alex Lieberman had just gotten the job in this as art director of Vogue in this kind of corporate coup, which I um, recount somewhat gleefully. <laughs> it's been recounted in many other books. Um, but it was so much fun to write with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I sort of felt like I want to depict all of these icons with feet of clay. <laughs> and and um, so- That was a really interesting part of the book. I, I, that yeah. is just to, to interject really quickly, but then, you know, we kind of think, or I kind of think of some of these- Always people. icons. <laughs> right, exactly. And that they were sort of born that way, you know? Yeah. Penn and Tony Purcell and Louise Dahl Wolf, and you know, that they just were always giants in the field. Yeah. But, but of course, they had to get there somehow. And right. that's one of the interesting things about the book right. is, is that sort of the power struggles yeah. and the jockeying for yeah. position that you describe yeah. in the photography studios of these magazines. It's really, yeah. it's interesting. Well, it's, in, it's in other books. And that was partly because. You know, the twins saw them that way because they were young when they were starting right. in these jobs. Mm -hmm. And um and and 
there's this really funny point where um, Catherine writes, a, there's a whole series of love letters from the twins to Jimmy or flirtatious letters. And Catherine says, um, oh, the former art director of Vogue, you know, has, has left Vogue and he's, he seems to be going off to war or something, which is so not true at all. <laughs> you know, he's, he's going back to Turkey to do espionage or something. <laughs> he's really been like elbowed out of the job. Right. So they were, you know, they were kind of dumb about some things. And then a, a few months later, Tony, her boss, Tony Frisell, her boss said to her, um, I, you know, the art director is, calling because he was looking for new young photographers I don't want to send you because I need you too much can I send your sister oh. and um you know neither of them thought anyone would get the job because they went out looking for jobs all the time so Catherine said sure send my sister and her sister got made a photographer at Vogue <laughs> so uh, really you know unleveled things between yeah them. yeah um, yeah you, yeah. you mentioned so I, the, I sort of sorry, did I'm it going. from this naive perspective that they both had and yeah uh, that was so much fun anyway you you mentioned the war and yeah. I, I just wanted to say that was another really interesting thing to me about the book was the way the war really influenced yeah um, fashion in the united states yes. and fashion photography yeah. fashion photography and i thought one really interesting piece of information that was that Fiorello LaGuardia of all people of was all people. Wasn't, that, wasn't that fascinating? I, I loved yeah. that part will you, will of it. Tell that how, how he yes. he was really behind this idea that that the center of the fashion world shouldn't be in Europe, which where yeah. it was sort of highfalutin and and yeah. you know, for the yeah. just for the kind of fancy people, but that yeah. should, it should be and I think he called it like where this great democracy with all these department stores and savvy shoppers and, and yes, so, exactly. right and so it was so really the center of the fashion world should yeah. be in new york yeah yeah a that seemed completely improbable at the time yeah. that it would be from paris yeah. and b so improbable that fiorella laguardia would have anything to do with the fashion world but he had had something to do with the fashion world because in his previous life He'd been the lawyer for the it's some complicated name, but it was like the some aspect of the textile the garment industry. industry. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. So he'd been very intimately involved with the problems of textile workers. And so when the war came, I think his first visit to the um, oh, I always get the name wrong, but it's the fashion. Nicole, I think you would know. Oh, what? Eleanor Lambert. Yes, it's the Fashion Guild. Oh God, the, the Fashion, fashion group. group International, or Fashion, was fashion Group International. Group yeah, no, it was so, fun to read about Fashion Group. Yeah, Ellen, Eleanor Lambert, who I had the opportunity to meet. Yeah, so. but it was before it was before she really got involved, or maybe it was as she was getting involved. But he was he went and met with them. I guess it was at the beginning of the war, or even but it was 1940 or something like that. It was before America was involved in the war. And he made this speech saying, you know, it's going to start, it's going to happen. You know, musicians are already over here and soon the fashion industry is going to be kaput and we're, we're already the center of music. We should be the center of fashion. And he really had this vision that he wanted America to take over. And he said, and you know, you should be really thinking he hated ladies' hats. So he was always going on about that. And he just thought they were really stupid. And, <laughs> and, he and said, the birds agree. Yes. And he <laughs> said, we should, hats used we should really export um, American. <laughs> and he said, we should really be exporting American style, not style descended from that aristocrats are wearing, but styles that every day American women are wearing, especially New Yorkers who need to stride out in their walk and take subways. And, you know, it was, it's this really funny speech. Yeah, <laughs> so I thought yeah. that is really interesting that the mayor of New York city is visiting, you know, really has a plan for the fashion industry <laughs> and yeah. everyone just thought he was nuts. <laughs> I think <laughs> but they kind of humored him. He didn't know anything about hats. <laughs> <laughs> and they wrote really funny stories about him in Women's Wear Daily. But they respected the fact that, you know, he 
I don't know, he at least he'd been the head of the, um, he'd been so involved with the garment industry in the past. And then when the war came to Paris and it was shut down, they were all like, oh my God, we have to do, what are we going to do? I, I mean, it's so interesting to read about the nuts and bolts of what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was and, behind and them. He installed um, this former mayor who'd been who'd had a corrupt administration, but um, he installed this former mayor in city hall so that the coats and tailors, I don't know, some guild had a direct line to city hall if there was any problem. He had already um, gotten um, he'd already designed gotten all of these women to design a line of ladies' uniforms, which coincidentally were due to roll out like two weeks after Pearl Harbor. <laughs> so oh. it, it were those the uniforms that were designed in like Air Force Blue or something yes. like that? Yes. He really he was that his idea? Yes. It was he had convened those women with Eleanor Roosevelt to design them. And it was just kind of a coincidence that Pearl Harbor happened. Hmm. Um so um I I mean yeah it was a coincidence it was like fortuitous timing yeah so <laughs> so weird. we should, we should I mean, move move forward in some yes. of the pictures because i think we're getting a little close to 45 i think we are too okay. uh... these are all taken by franny this is junior vogue i think mm. see but the clothes and clothes america was already moving towards sportswear this is also vogue can we see the top of the pictures well maybe it doesn't matter this is glamour 1947 which is when the war was over. Everything totally changed. And women were told, pack it up, girls, you know, have babies, get married, have babies, stop with the career business. But this is the bride in the business suit because they weren't quite ready to pack it up. This is Franny at work in 1946 for Glamour. I don't know why it keeps flipping back and forth. Okay, we're going back to Fuffy. Catherine, sorry. This is 1943-44 um, photo she took while she was working for Tony. She was able to take over a lot of Tony's jobs. Can you, uh, yeah, that's really interesting because yes. you see how, what's, so what's in the background? Yes, so this is on Christie Street and all of these buildings are still there today. So, okay, up in this picture on the left, that's a Japanese soldier um, hanging um, in effigy from a fire escape. And so the street is just filled with all of this, junk which her team was moving around to make a good picture um one of those fun examples where you can really see how the cropping yeah. and the framing of isn't that great yeah yeah and yeah. then this is her at work and i wanted to get one of these for the book but there was no negative so it was it didn't work but that's what the street looked like and there's the pile of junk behind her it's amazing yeah so these are the pictures she was taking for charm. She was discovered when her twin went to um, Condé Nast. She was like totally thrown and had to equalize the balance. So she quit her job and with Tony Frisell and went freelance. And within about a year, she'd been discovered by the editor of Charm, which was a competitor with Glamour. Um, and... Um, this is one of the first photos she did for them, which I think is really stunning. Oh, the light. This is, so after the war, everybody started traveling again, and they sent photographers out on location. This was taken in Cuba. I think it's just such a great shot. Um, she was traveling way more than Franny, who was in the studio and sort of confined to the East Coast at first. Um, this was taken in California. These were both in California. This is um, Catherine and her husband, Jimmy Abbey, um, went to Paris when, you know, people started going back to Europe. Um, this is New Year's 47 to 48. And this is a picture of Leonore Fini, the surrealist. A lot of people, she was a famous figure in Paris by then. A lot of photographers were going to her studio and taking her picture but I think this really stands up with the best of those pictures. And, oh, this is, <laughs> I love this, this is, this is what the Abbey's um, 
storage space looks like. So I didn't go through all these boxes, but this I went through. This is how the sausage is made, Carol. Yeah, <laughs> I just thought I'd stick this in to show you what it. This is what you have to go like. through. like, yeah. So shall I start the screen sharing and we can talk about yes. autism? Okay. Yeah, I think we're we're almost, uh, it's almost time for questions, but I, I have one question first, which is, so the twins were, you know, they were always taking pictures of each other yes. from a young age. They even shared a camera when they were. Yes, they right? weren't, I think they were playing with the camera when they were really little, but they yeah. were given a camera as a high school, a good camera as a high school graduation present. By and they were always taking pictures of each other kind of on the move. And, and, yes. and do you think that that's one of the, the kind of qualities of their photographs that were? I yes, I think it totally gave to people them, who hired them. Yes, I think it totally gave them an edge over some of the photography was much more static when they started. And the photo that appealed to Alex Lieberman when he hired Franny was a picture she had taken of her sister at the beach. And right. I think he was going for a naturalistic, snapshotty, um, he'd, he had been the managing editor of the one of the magazines that inspired Life magazine. And he was going for this naturalistic, snapshotty kind of thing. And it seems to me she had an edge over a lot of men who'd been taking more posed formal kinds of photographs. It um, seemed like they're, they're, they sort of coincided nicely with a shift in, I mean, because Tony Fursell was sort of known for that too, yeah. taking these actions sort of in yes. more sort of athletic women and, yes. and, you know, on the beach and running yes. and moving and that they were sort of ahead of the game in that way that they yes. had already started taking those kinds of pictures. And they just did it very naturally and then developed, um, he would prod her in the right way by saying, that's that's good. Do more of that. You know, um, he edged Tony Fursell out because he felt her outdoor shots were too staged, and and sometimes they were. Um, mm -hmm. But it was it was just sort of a freer, you know. Both of them, their photos look so modern. I think you know right. they they could have been taken today in a lot right. of places. Mm -hmm. But they just went oh, around the city taking pictures of each other. I wanted to go back to the beginning of the book because it opens with a comment from Dick Cavett that's <laughs> very sexist. And then towards the end of the book, there's this um, photo shoot of Vogue photographers that Francis is not oh, invited right. to. And in between those events, there are a number of things that happened that perhaps should not have. Um, so you encountered a number of places where sexism really affected their career. And I'm just yeah. curious to oh. what surprised you the most. Well, I think the comment you are talking about with Dick Cavett was where he said they were on his show because they'd written a book called Twins on Twins. And right. so he did keep talking about twins rather than their careers as photographers. And then he said, have you heard the one about, did you know that there are twin porn stars? And they both said, really really were they men or women <laughs> or he'd watched this porn video recently with twins um so they kind of like pinned him down on it because they'd heard every joke or everything there was to say about twins but mm -hmm. I sure I kept feeling like I was dick Cavett because I had to investigate their sex lives which was a horrible position to be in <laughs> so the joke of putting that there was like oh my god I'm in <laughs> I'm being I'm being the same way <laughs> well you were continuously I, I think, asked <laughs> I, yes and, and and I did have to like talk to people so what do you think <laughs> um it was horrible but um <laughs> I, th I think they'd heard every possible thing there was, you know, they were beautiful. They'd heard every possible dirty joke anyone could make. And they were practiced in deflecting. And um, it, it was just like uh, another one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> um, I think I, 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 I mean, and I found as I was trying to research them, I had a lot of trouble 
I was trying to get people to show me how cameras worked. And I had a lot of mm. trouble getting guys to take the project seriously because it's often guys that have these cameras. Mm. So the first guys I found who were willing to show me cameras took ages to pin them down. And then they kind of dismissed me and said, so they must have been rich, right? <laughs> Which they weren't. I mean, I just couldn't believe it. <laughs> they must have been well to do. No, they were broke oh, and they had to earn money. So I think it might be time to open it up for questions. Um, yeah, in case uh, anyone watching has any questions for Carol. I see Nancy Hall Duncan does. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in now back with okay. you. So uh, yes, thank you so much. It was great to see all those images and to see everything and to hear you all talk together. Um, there, it does seem that there are some hands up, um, raised hands, and I'll ask if you can put the questions in the Q and A instead of raising your hand. So if you can type them in, that would be quite helpful for us. Um, I'll start off by asking a question while people might be typing, um, which I'm not sure maybe I missed, but how how long were they working in their career? Oh, they worked till the end. I'm not sure how long they were taking photographs for. Um, towards the end, Franny had um, dementia. So I think she stopped. I forget what I decided in the, you know, we kind of resolved with the family and her former assistant, like what point she couldn't work. But they, I think they, as long as they could stand, they always had cameras. Um, and um, there was a film, oh God, I don't have my crib sheet in front of me, but they made, they did the, book twins on twins in 1980 they did a film with nina rosen um nina rosenblum um in 2000 i think a film about themselves and then they did a book 10 years later um i think the book was mostly catherine but with participation from franny as well so they were they were working until they couldn't work and and they had successful careers until the end. So okay, and they were yeah. working still for magazines and yeah, in that fashion. Yeah. Thing. Franny worked was on contract after the studio closed. Franny was on contract for another twenty years, and she says she stopped shooting fashion when um, Diana Vreeland came to Vogue because they just didn't see eye to eye on what a fashion photograph was. Um, but I think she still kept working for doing other kinds of shots for different magazines. I didn't look too much into House and Garden. She was also working for House and Garden and other, and I just, so much was undigitized and I found out what was there by paging through magazines and there was limited, <laughs> there's like limited, I had limited ability to page through magazines. I did an awful lot, but. Okay, let's Garden. see, here's so, another question. Can Carol speak more about how their work has not been recognized until recently. Mm. Well, Franny was always kind of low key recognized, I would say, but just not given her due. Um, so I established a lot of things like, she was the first woman to shoot the Paris collections for Vogue. She was the first person to shoot Dior for the cover. It was Dior ready to wear, but first Dior shot on the cover. She's, you know, there are just a number of things like that. She seems to have been the first person to shoot the first magazine photographer to shoot inside the Chateau of Versailles. Um, and then Catherine, because she switched to taking photos of children, that's just an immediately dismissible career path. And we, I think we should ask ourselves why that is, because uh, around the time she was doing it, I meant to look up the date, but there's a photo spread in US camera, the US camera annual uh, uh, at the time when a lot of women had, who had been taking photos in the forties, um, who had been taking fashion photos in the forties, then in the fifties, as men had come back from the war and were being acclaimed as the genius of photography, you know, a lot of women moved to taking photos of artists, taking photos of authors, and then taking photos of children. So at that time, US camera annual, and I forget the date, but they did this amazing spread of like 
let's see how the real experts do it. And it's photos of children taken by the great male, great male photographers of the day. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't think I need to say anything more about that. <laughs> but I mean, what's so wrong with photos of children? <laughs> Everybody, many people have children mm -hmm. and they like photos of children. So mm -hmm. why is that so inherently repugnant a subject if done well? I, I, we really need to ask ourselves why that's so repulsive. So anyway, that you denigrate the people who take those pictures. Mm. Yeah. Sure. I, I'd really like somebody to answer that question for me. Mm. So. Well, hopefully we'll, we'll figure that answer out. <laughs> yeah. um, Sounds like another talk. We have another to talk, it. another, another topic. Um, <laughs> let me go to another same. question though. Okay. Um, did the twins ever offer advice to other women photographers who are trying to make their way in the photo world? Uh, yeah, know, from in, what in I've, a mentorship type of way. Yeah, from what I've heard, they were um, really generous. Uh, th there were tons of um, Catherine worked with a lot of students at her children's school, so I spoke to tons of um, younger women who had worked with her and had studied had helped her in her studio and had studied with her and um franny was a teacher at sva for quite a while so i i did keep running into her students and talking to her students so um i think they were very beloved by right. other people yeah and oh and jean had mentioned there's that chapter in my book about the various ways that women women got screwed either by um, you know, by hitting a glass ceiling, um, or sometimes by other women. Tony, Tony Frisell was, she did end up at Harper's Bazaar eventually, but Louise Dahl Wolf just, uh, when there was some question of running Tony Frisell's war photos in um, Harper's Bazaar, Louise Dahl Wolf said, I will walk if anything of hers comes near this magazine. I, you know, Louise Dahl Wolf was really a monster. And um, the twins didn't encounter that so much. They had a mentor in um, that College Bazaar editor who they had a lot of help and generosity from women. Excellent. That's great. Um, I do have one question from the audience if the, and I'm going to, audience, I hope you don't mind, I'm going to kind of make it a little briefer, but um, yeah. did they have families? And um, also, was their mother an artist? Because it's a, they say someone clearly fanned the flames of their creativity. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. So their mother, I think, was a fashion plate who wanted great things for her twins their grandfather was a policeman who, you know, walked a beat in Prospect Park, as far as I know. Um, so their grandmother, their mother had high ambitions for her daughters um, and they had families. So Franny had one daughter who's an architect and who designs the, ex does the exhibition design for the Jewish Museum, among other things, um, and designs buildings too. But um, and then Catherine and Jimmy had um, three children and um, who were doing various different things. And then their cousin was Tommy DePaola, who I meant to mention him in the book and it just didn't happen, but the children's book author who also went to Pratt and built a studio, created a studio in memory of all three of them. So. Thank you, that, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. Um, this is a comment from Nancy Hall Duncan uh -huh. saying it because I, she, I she um, writes, um, I think more of a comment than a question, but I'll read it to you. So you have it. Um, I was good friends with Franny and Fluffy and Lisa Fonsgrave Pens and worked for them very early in my career, organizing their photo archives. We talked photography mm. for hours. I wanted to say that when I became the mother of triplets, <laughs> Franny and Fuffy were deliriously happy. They packed up their equipment and spent an entire day shooting me and my triplets for an article 
for good housekeeping. Oh, I never saw that. Oh, how the pictures were sadly lost when a messenger dropped them down an elevator shaft. Oh, I think we discussed that. Yeah, I think we yes, did. So, and that. then there's a congratulations to you there. Thank you. Um, oh, that is fascinating. And then I'm going to ask this one last question. Um, well, actually, we're, we're one last question. Um, do you have any favorite images that showed us that you feel subvert the male gaze in fashion photography? Hmm. Lots of them. I think the I think the fact that the women look so naturalistic and are just going about their business in in all of these photos. Um, they're just living their lives. I I think um, many of their photos do that. It's not for a gaze particularly they're just sort of caught there are all these photos that I didn't include in the book where women are looking into windows but looking at themselves or looking into mirrors it's sort of ruminative and inward looking but just the sense that it's depicting life as it's lived you know a lot of their photos do that and um it's not glamorized they're not gussied up and, and there's this period in, in the book where their lives start to reflect the lives that they're photographing and you can't tell which is coming first, it, it, you know, which is driving which. I found that really fascinating. So are, are, they, are they leading their lives after their photos or are the photos driving their lives? It, it's really hard to tell. It, it's really interesting to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and thank you all so much for joining us. I'm very briefly, I did this before. I'm putting into the chat a link to the book if anyone's <laughs> interested in getting it. It's in the chat. Um, it will also be when we put this talk online on the APAD website, there'll be a link there as well for everyone. Thank you. <laughs> but um, it, this has been a wonderful hour of time. I thank all three of you for coming. Carol, it, fascinating book, um, fascinating subject and topic. And um, just thank you so much for, for joining us. And thank you all out there in the virtual world for joining us as well. And um, I hope that when we're in New York in April, we get to see all three of you in person and all of you that are online, I hope you'll join us at the show. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. so yeah. much, and um, have a wonderful afternoon.